Hello, welcome back to another drawing video. Uh, my name is Molly, if you didn't already know that. Uh, and this is actually part two of a little series I'm doing um, on this weird piece that I'm drawing. Um, if you missed part one, there'll be a link in the description. Uh, in part one, we basically uh, did the main sketch, which I just inserted right now. The main sketch was done in Procreate, but now we have moved on to Adobe Fresco. Um, these are both really good digital drawing programs. Um, I would recommend either one. Uh, they just have some different features. Uh, so the reason that I wanted to play around in Fresco with this piece is I've been really curious about uh, their vector drawing tools. Um, if you don't know much about digital illustration uh, or what a vector is, basically the difference between a vector image and a pixel image in digital drawing is that a vector is infinitely resizable. So basically that means you can shrink it or enlarge it a million different times to any size and it will never lose quality. It will always be nice and sharp. Uh, whereas with a pixel image, if you resize it, it generally loses a bit of quality, gets a bit fuzzy around the edges. Um, so yeah, so I just don't have much experience working with vectors. So I've really been wanting to play around with it and it's part of the reason I decided to draw this piece in the first place was with the intention of playing around with this vector drawing tool. So yeah, just like in the last video, I'm kind of just going to chat about the process, what I'm doing. Um, like I said also in my last video, I am not super familiar with Fresco or with vectors, um, or quite honestly with digital illustration outside of tattooing. Uh, so this is all super new for me, which is kind of fun. Um, I love messing around with tools like this and seeing what kind of interesting effects you can create. Um, one of my favorite things about digital drawing is all the different brushes and the different textures and the different uh, layering effects that you can get. Um, so yeah, we're going to do a little bit of that today. Um, I hope you're all doing all right out there. Uh, I hope you're finding time even in this ridiculous, strange time to get creative, to make some art or do something else that just stimulates that creative feeling. I've been doing, you know, okay. Um, I just took a little mini vacation with my partner. We went to a provincial park for the day and did some activities, some walks with our dog and some outdoor skating, which was nice and refreshing uh, because we also just learned that we still can't go back to work. So it's been a bit of a mixed week emotions wise, uh, but I am actually really happy with this piece and I'm excited to share it. So. We're looking on the positive side today. <laughs> it's a slow start, but I promise we get there in the end. I struggle a bit with the sunglasses and getting the angles right, um, but it comes around. I also was just getting used to this vector brush at the very beginning. So I end up messing with the settings a little bit um, and just getting it to a place where, you know, the, the dynamics of the digital brush work well with how my hand moves. So yeah, you can see that I've finally sort of gotten the hang of it and I get the glasses drawn finally. And then we move on with lining the rest of this figure. Um, I honestly had a great time using this vector tool in Fresco. Um, once I got kind of used to how smooth the lines were and how slow the brush was, uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think that if you're getting into digital illustration, something to consider is you might want to sell your work to, I don't know, a, a publishing company or an advertising company or, you know, a small business or whoever might um, ask you to do work for them. Uh, they're probably going to want vector images so that they can resize things and edit things without losing quality. Um, 
And this is probably something that people who attend art school properly <laughs> already know. Uh, but this is pretty new to me, so I really recommend getting into uh, Illustrator um, if you've got it, or just finding a program like Fresco where you can mess around with vectors and get used to the differences between pixel images and vector images. So yeah, I, I kept this video, uh, the video speed, I mean, pretty slow. Uh, um, just because I find it so satisfying <laughs> to watch the line work playback. Um, it's not quite at live speed, but it's only sped up just a little bit. Um, just so you won't be sitting here for hours and hours watching me work on something. One thing I will say about that is if you're getting into drawing, um, whatever your skill level is, I really advise you not to stress too much about how long things take. Um, as someone who draws a lot and usually has to draw every day for their work, some days you're just in a vibe, you sit down and things work, your hand feels like it's connected to your brain, and you know, you can just look at a thing and draw it and be like satisfied with that drawing. And then other days, it's like you can't draw to save your life, and everything takes a thousand years. And honestly, it's just all part of the process. Uh, creativity, like so many other things, is affected by a variety of factors in your life. Um, and so don't be too hard on yourself if you try to draw things and it takes a lot longer than you think it should. There's no right or wrong answer, you know. It's just about working through it and taking your time sometimes. Um, honestly, at normal playback speed, it took me, I think, about three hours to make this piece. Um, and I've sped it up enough to fit into a couple of shorter videos. But, you know, that's the thing is sometimes it takes 30 minutes, sometimes it takes three hours. Uh, I'd say that this part of the drawing is the part that I was most comfortable with. Um, and so it goes a little bit faster. Uh, usually in my digital like tattoo sketching, it's mostly line work. Um, I do a lot of black work. Um, so that is my strength digitally, is just lining things, doing some solid blacks, maybe a little hint of color here and there, but nothing really full color. Um, definitely no like realism or neo-traditional, nothing with lots of color and shading. Um, so even though I start this off sort of in my comfort zone, my goal was to try new things. And so I eventually end up really messing around with the colors, um, and this piece gets a little wildly colorful. Um, I can't wait for you to see it. Um, it's really fun. And I had a lot of fun figuring out how to use colors <laughs> effectively. As I'm drawing this hand and gun, um, I think I mentioned this a bit in the first video when I was talking about the sketch, but this hand is not proportionate and this gun ends up looking a little bit messy. I actually later on end up going back and completely erasing and redoing this and changing the gun up completely because just something wasn't sitting right with me. Having an actual gun was not the vibe that I was going for and it just took me a while to figure out the vibe. So I just, I drew it in because I just wanted to keep drawing and I didn't want to stress too much about what I was going to change or add. Um, so yeah, so I just, I draw it all in, but later on I do go back and completely erase this. <laughs> uh, it's just all part of the process. Sometimes you spend 20, 30, 40 minutes drawing something and then you change it completely. <laughs> what are you going to do? Art is hard. I think part of what was bugging me was this gun just had this like really cartoony vibe. And it's not that I didn't want a cartoony vibe, it's just it wasn't quite the right one. It was just a little bubbly. It, I felt like she was holding like a like a blow up gun. <laughs> Does that make sense? I don't know. I just, I did not like it. I try to fix so many different things before I realize that it is the gun as a whole that just needs to go. Oh, I also want to mention, uh, I think somewhere in the next couple of videos, I'm going to do something that's a little bit more 
like a step-by-step -step tutorial. Um, I've had a few people mention that they would like a little bit more direct art instruction, which could be fun. So I'm going to try it. I'm going to do a little video about drawing hands. Um, I draw a lot of hands in my work. It's something that I work really hard on so that I don't struggle with it too much. I mean, hands are still sometimes a nightmare. Certain poses can be really difficult, but I think that I have a pretty good system for drawing believable hands in almost any pose fairly easily. So yeah, I think I'm going to share that soon. Um, and hopefully you guys like it. Hopefully you'll draw some hands with me. So yeah, now, as you can see, I um, started adding a little bit of color um, because I got basically the main outline of the figure down um, and I had no idea what I was going to do next. So one thing I knew for sure is I wanted this sort of watery, bubbly, speech bubbly kind of shape coming out of the gun. So I just did that next. Um, I find when I'm working on a piece where I don't really have a perfect plan of what I'm going to do, I just take it step by step. When I finish one part, I just say, okay, what's the one other thing that I know I want to do? And then I do that um, and just build it up slowly. Don't get too overwhelmed about the whole picture, um, but just add the pieces that you know you want to add until eventually the whole thing will be full. So at this point, I start trying to figure out a bit of a color palette. Um, choosing a palette for a piece is such a personal thing. I feel like I can't possibly give too many tips on it. Everyone likes different colors. Um, but I will say that there are lots of helpful sort of um, color wheel guides online that can help you choose colors that will look good together. Um, a good rule is, I mean, complementary colors, um, which are, you know, opposite of each other on a color wheel, blue and orange, red and green, purple and yellow, um, or uh, tertiary colors, which again is dividing the color wheel up just into thirds instead of into two. Um, but also there's lots of weird color combinations out there that look awesome. And like I said, so much of it is personal preference. I'm really a fan of the blues and the purples. I like to stick with a lot of cool colors. So yeah, we're just adding some color. Um, something that I do want to mention is in this piece, I mess around a lot with blend modes. Um, blend modes are an option in pretty much any digital drawing program, whether it's like Procreate or even Adobe Photoshop or anything at all. Um, usually they have this little option that you can see on the right hand side that says blend mode um, where you can mess around with the way that the layer you're on will interact with the other layers. So basically just to give like a really simple explanation when the blend mode is on normal all the layers are solid and they sit one on top of the other depending on what order you put them in. But when you start messing with the blend mode layers become semi-transparent or the colors on one layer will interact with the colors on the layer beneath in a different way. Um, honestly, this is something that I don't know a ton about, except for the little that I've learned by just purely messing around with it. Um, so in this piece, I decided I wanted to really mess around with the blend modes and try out some weird color combinations and some like overlay kind of effects. Um, so I'll definitely get into that a bit more. At this point, I'm just sort of blocking in all the main shapes. Um, I honestly don't even remember if I end up sticking with some of these original colors, but I just picked colors that the contrast would be really obvious and I'd be able to see what I was working on. Um, and I block all of these shapes in on their own layer. Um, using lots of different layers, is great when you're working on digital pieces because it just gives you a lot of freedom in the editing process later on. Um, for example, these two moths where the shapes sort of interact, because I've drawn them on separate layers, I can move each moth individually to get the composition just right. Because um, I think I even decide as I'm drawing this second moth that the overlap of the two is not quite the right overlap. Um, and I end up shifting it around a little bit 
uh, which is something that wouldn't have been as easy to do if I had just drawn both moths on the same layer right on top of each other. Um, and yeah, this is what I was talking about with messing with blend modes. I was just trying out a few different things, um, kind of seeing what effects I could achieve. Um, multiply, honestly, like people who actually know about digital work are going to laugh at my very limited knowledge, but multiply is something that I use a lot. It's sort of uh, almost a semi-transparent sort of effect. Um, so you get some nice color blends, um, like you can see the the smaller moth where it overlaps the pink moth, you get this sort of double image effect that I really like. What am I doing now? Oh, I think that I am mapping out this figure. Yeah, so I go in with the lasso tool um, and just go all around the, the main border of this figure um, so that I can lay in a flat color underneath um, to get the coloring of this lady started. At this point, once again, I still have no freaking clue what I am going to do with this. <laughs> uh, I'm just truly taking it step by step and I know I want color, so I figure it's time to block in some colors. Um, Again, this is not a new idea for me, but it's something worth mentioning. If you're new to digital drawing, blocking in flat colors will save you eons of time. Um, it's a lot easier to work on sort of a, a flat base than it is um, to just work directly on your background. So that's what I'm doing now is using this little uh, tool. You just sort of, you know, outline the whole shape and then it will give me a perfectly lady shaped selection that I can fill with whatever color I want. Um, and then once I have that flat color, it just makes everything a lot easier moving forward to add, you know, different uh, tones or um, different shades or shadows, highlights, whatever it is. Um, I'm working on something flat rather than a confusing background outline. I think at this point I was just trying to figure out what features Fresco has and doesn't have that I'm used to using on Procreate. Um, there are definitely some things that I like better about Procreate and some things that I like better about uh, Adobe Fresco. Um, which is why I've kind of been enjoying doing these types of pieces where I do some of the sketching in Procreate and some of it in Fresco and taking stuff back and forth. Um, so yeah, at this point I was like, do I mess with this layer? Is it a blend mode issue? Then I realized, no, it's an issue of this freaking white choice that I made. Like, why did I not choose a more saturated color? So I just go in and start adding some color. Um, I knew immediately that she was going to be a blonde. I can't explain why. She just has the aura of a blonde person. But you know what? I'm going to be honest, the aura of a blonde person who is blonde by choice and not by birth. Uh, if you know what I mean, there are certain people who always dye their hair blonde and honestly I have such respect for them because it is a chore to dye your whole head blonde, especially if you have darker hair. That is a commitment to looking great and honestly, so much respect for you. If you're a person who continuously bleaches your hair, I fear your power quite honestly. I really wish I could be a person that could bleach my whole head. Um, I wouldn't leave it blonde. I would probably dye it some fantastical color. I unfortunately, sadly, cannot do that because I have really sensitive skin and bleach really hurts me <laughs> in a bad way. So I've bleached little chunks of my hair, but I've never been able to commit to bleaching the entire thing uh, with the intention of dyeing it. So. If you're out there choosing to be blonde or choosing to bleach your dark hair on a regular basis, good for you. One feature that Adobe Fresco seems to be missing that I really use all the time in Photoshop is something called locking transparency. So basically if you have a shape um, like the white sort of background color of this figure, um, 
in Procreate, you would be able to lock the transparency of that shape, um, which means that you won't be able to draw outside the lines. Uh, even if you scribble all over the screen, it'll only show up on the white figure that you've blocked out to begin with. Uh, you can obviously unlock it to make changes, but honestly, I, I use that feature constantly and it seems like Fresco doesn't have it. If someone knows about it and I'm just missing it somehow, please let me know. But it seems like it doesn't have it. So I had to get a little creative on how I would do what I was doing. Uh, like you can see how I just was using the lasso tool again and just the paint bucket to <laughs> try to uh, color this figure without having to like go in and individually color every little section. It only sort of worked. <laughs> um, and honestly, it takes me a little while to just get this going. I use the lasso tool a lot to separate off the shapes, which is kind of the same thing, but just a bit more annoying than the locked transparency feature. Um, but that's kind of the fun of a piece like this and working with a program that you're not used to. It's the same as working with a medium that you're not used to in traditional art making. Half of the fun is messing around and finding solutions to problems that you weren't expecting or problems you've you know never encountered before with mediums that you're more comfortable with. So yeah, um, really for this part, um, most of the rest of this video, I'm just sorting out um, the colors for my central outlined figure. Um, I really wanted this piece to get really sort of patterny and layered and lots of bright colors, uh, but I still wanted this figure to stand out. So that's why I start the color here. Um, I mean, I sort of laid in my background color just to get a sense of the direction I was going, but then I really focus on this figure for this first bit, and I am really happy with how it turns out in the end. Um, I end up messing with the blend mode, which you can see here. I'm just trying to see if anything interesting happens, um, and then I get to exclusion, and I'm like, oh, hello. And I know that it ruins her little blonde moment, but I just became obsessed with this like blue skin, blue hair combo. I think especially with the pink kind of salmon-y color of the robe, it just was really working for me. <laughs> and even the, uh, the little bits of overlay where the moth shapes intersect with her shape, I just really love the like softness of those colors. So I end up going with this and it takes me a little while to get used to using the exclusion feature and seeing how exactly it works. Um, I, especially when I'm doing like the shading on her face, I have to mess around a little bit uh, with my colors. Uh, but in the end, I think that it turns out really cool. <laughs> this is me back again, struggling with this freaking gun. I just did not know how I wanted it to look. Um, at this point I think I'm just coloring it so that it's you know separates it a bit from the other shapes but I already was so annoyed with this gun that I just didn't know what direction to take it honestly that's so typical of me in my drawing process I will go back and mess around with little tiny details and change them over and over and over uh, it's honestly like sometimes I'll get the drawing 99% finished and I'll get stuck on one of the hands for an hour or a day and it's you know just one of those things that you can't avoid sometimes sometimes there's just one ugly bit of a drawing and often in those times I find the most helpful thing is to take a break um, step away a little bit I don't know, rest my eyes, I guess, and then come back to it a little bit later with fresh eyes and see if whatever's bugging me stands out to me a bit more. But sometimes it's just a struggle and you can't escape it. 
So this is where I started to block in some of the shadows on her face. Um, and this is also when I realized that I did not understand how exclusion mode works. I turn it off to do this part of the drawing and then occasionally turn it back on to sort of check my work. And I learned pretty fast that I was doing it backwards um, with exclusion mode. To get that sort of shadowed effect, you actually have to use a lighter color. Um, this is where, you know, people with real Photoshop knowledge will be cringing at me for just like not knowing what I'm doing and doing it anyways. Um, but yeah, just getting these like shadow shapes in was still helpful. And then I just use the fill bucket a little bit later to change the actual color so that when exclusion mode is turned on, they actually work how I want them to work. Um, there's so much to be said about choosing light sources and working with light sources, especially with underlying bone structure and stuff like that. But I'm honestly not confident that I could fit those types of tips into a short video like this. I maybe one day could do a whole separate video talking about light sources and anatomy and who knows. But for now, we're just going to talk about coloring and blend modes and easy stuff like that. I do take advantage here of the fact that I have the exclusion mode uh, turned off and just sort of like add different colors and layers um, to this whole figure. Um, and I think most of it goes pretty well. I don't have to do too many changes once I turn exclusion mode back on. Um, yeah, there's just something about this like salmon pink robe. I mean, it eventually will become salmon pink. That just like was really working for me. <laughs> it just had the perfect vibe of like casual vacation vibes combined with her sort of femme fatale face and gun wieldingness. Oh, you can see this is where I realized I don't understand exclusion mode and was gonna have to make some changes. So I go back to normal and then I change this color up to a much lighter color, sort of working with the opposite of what I would usually work with to create shadows. Um, and that ends up doing the trick. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that you learn when you try new programs and you try new features. Um, it's part of the fun. So yeah, there you can see it's more of the shadowed effect now that I've used the lighter color. Um, and yeah, I, I'm really into it. I love that the trim of her robe kind of matches that one moth. Like I said before, the blue hair, blue skin combo is really doing it for me. Did you ever watch The Proud Family when you were a kid? Oh my God. There was, oh, the sisters. Were they called the Weird Sisters? I think they were called the Weird Sisters or something like that. Um, and they were all blue blue skin, blue hair, blue clothes, I'm pretty sure. And they were just the best. Honestly, that was one of the prime shows of my childhood. And clearly some of the aesthetic has stuck with me because the blue on blue is my new favorite thing. So you can see I'm kind of moving on for a second from our little femme fatale and I'm lining some of these moths. Um, I decided to keep the moth outlines kind of basic and as simplified as I could make them. Almost a little um, graphic, cartoonish even, um, because I just wanted some good contrast and sort of the suggestion of these shapes. Um, enough detail so that you know it's a moth, but not so much detail that it's distracting from the figure in front. Um, so yeah, so I just go in with, I think it's, I think it's black at this point, but I end up changing it to like a deep kind of burgundy on the maroon sort of side of things color, um, just so that it layers even better with the pink underneath. Um, but yeah, just getting these sort of mothy shapes in. Um, this is no moth in particular. I didn't even use a reference for this. Um, I just kind of know what moths look like. Um, or at least I know enough that people will be convinced that they're looking at a moth, even if it is not a type of moth that exists in real life. 
so yeah, just getting in these fluffy bits, fixing my mistakes. <laughs> Sometimes it's a pain. Uh, trying to get rid of this little tiny bit of line that I overextended and it just is such an ordeal. <laughs> Way more difficult than it should have been. But that's just me getting used to this vector tool. Yeah, the thing I really like about moths is these like big points of contrast that they generally have on their wings, and sometimes even on their bodies. They tend to be like fairly light colored, but with big brown patches, dark patterns. Um, I just think it works really well contrast wise. Or maybe that's just <laughs> my excuses for just wanting to draw moths and wanting to justify that in some way. But you know what? I just like moths. I'm going to include them all the time and nobody can tell me not to because it's my drawing. That's the whole point. Here is where I began a short struggle of what does this moth's face look like? Um, I don't know. I just, I knew I just wanted some cutesy little eyes, but I was just struggling with the exact shape and how to fit them in and if I should aim slightly more realistic or if I should just abandon realism and go for a cutesy cartoon moth and I kind of settle on that just again keeping it kind of graphic so that it's not super complicated background detail but it's really clear right away that it's a moth that you're looking at um, just like with these fluffy antenna that have no place in reality purely just imaginary moth things. So yeah, um, there's only a couple minutes left of this video. Uh, in this part, we're gonna finish up the moth outlines. Actually, I think just the first moth outline. Uh, but then I'm gonna call it for the day because that's about half an hour and who has time to watch a YouTube video that's longer than half an hour? Uh, so next time we'll be back with the final part uh, to finish this up, we'll finish the other moth and we'll start adding a whole ton of background elements, playing with the blend modes a little bit more to get some cool color effects. Um, and I think I also add a bit more detail and layering to the figure. Oh, and also in the next part, we're going to do a quick little redraw of the gun that she's holding. I end up switching it out for a very different type of gun. So you'll have to tune back in to see how it goes. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this little process vid and I hope that you will be back for part three in just another couple of days. Uh, as always, um, you can find more of my work on Instagram or on my website. There are links to both of those places down in the description as well as on uh, my channel. Um, I also would like to mention that you can get this image um, that I'm working on in this video. You can buy it from my Gumroad as a desktop wallpaper um, and I think also a phone wallpaper. Um, it's available in my March digital pack which is up uh, for pay what you want on Gumroad. Um, so the link to that is also on my channel. Thank you so much for watching uh, and I will see you again next time. Have a good one.
What? <laughs> 